Hey guys, um, so this is my first live stream. It looks like no one is here right now, so that's promising. Um, I wanted to go over these packets with you guys. Um, I figured we would eventually get to this packet, the grammar packet, but not right now. We'll get through the reading stuff and then the grammar stuff. Um, so my plan for when I do the live streams, cause I'll be here from six to seven on Wednesdays to help with any of your guys' questions. It doesn't necessarily mean like just ELA. I can try to help with anything, but I don't know how much help I'll need. Um, so what was I saying? Oh, so I wanted to start by going over the sixth grade packet for like 15 ish minutes, the seventh grade packet for about 15 ish minutes, and then the eighth grade packet for like 15 minutes. If you guys want, we can start diving into the grammar packet. You don't have to, we can postpone that. That's fine. Um, the other thing I wanted to say too is you guys have assignments posted on the Google Classroom already. Um, let me pull them up and I can tell you your classroom codes. Oh, I'm on the wrong email. Okay, so far uh, for the sixth grade, the code is BC 2 n to IB for lunar and Venus the code is Z C D T H X L and then for fireball and cosmic it is J T X J L C D also shout out to Ra Raquel for posting a picture reminding everyone to wash their hands daily. I just saw that. Um, yeah, so at least for the eighth grade, let's see. You guys have Mr. Murray posted all of To Kill Mockingbird on the Google Classroom, so you guys have that. He posted a chapter 11, chapter 12, and chapter 13 quiz. The vocabulary for this week and what is this? Oh, I think a link to the book. Um, I also created a YouTube channel section where you guys, I'm going to be making videos of me like reading these packets. Um, and I'm going to be posting the links to the videos there if you want. That's for all the classes. Um, for the seventh graders, Mr. Murray in the Google Classroom posted a quiz over Act One. Um, Act 1, Scene 4 quiz, Act 1, Scene 5, Complet Types, um, Vocabulary Assignment for this week, and then just a small assignment. Um, for the 6th graders, you guys should also, in your Google Classroom, be working on a prompt that I found. Where is it? Oh, there it is. Okay. So if you could spend the night in any store, which store would you choose? Where would you sleep for the night? What would you eat? Where would you explore? Answer the above prompt in eight to 10 sentences. Just because you have answered all the questions does not mean that you've completed the assignment. Um, you are to answer the prompts on the Google Doc that is attached to this assignment. So if you scroll down on the Google Classroom, there is a Google Doc that you can open. You can type on it because each student has their own copy of it. Make sure though that when you guys are done, um, I think it's in the top right hand corner. There's a button that says turn in. You have to turn the assignment in or else I don't get notified that you turned it in. So someone turned in already. Shout out to David Nolan. Just kidding. It was, no, it was David. It was David. It's fine. Shout out to David for turning his assignment already. Um, I also think it's weird that I can see who or I can't see who is watching me, but I can see four people are watching me. 
that's interesting, a little weird. Feel free to say hi. So I know who it is and it's not a complete stranger. Um, I also sent out an email while we're wasting time for people to come and ask questions um, about how to get into the Google Classrooms. Um, so step one of entering the Google Classroom, you guys need to log out of all Gmail accounts that you guys have on. Oh, hello, Miss Yingling. Winston bailed, but hello. Anyway, um, you guys have to log out of all Gmail accounts that you are currently logged into on your laptop or tablet, computer, whatever you're using. Um, otherwise, it won't let you log in because you're logged into multiple accounts and it's not smart enough to figure out which account you're trying to log in from. Um, step two, you have to log into your Student Summit Academy Google account. So it must be your like student issued Summit Academy email. Um, so if I were a student, mine would be page.miller at summitacademies.org. I know your guys' students is different and it's SA-students. Um, if you forgot your login somehow in like the three days we've been out of school, um, we do have access to that. So don't think because you forgot or you claim to have forgotten your email that you can't join the school classroom. Um, Step three, I'm trying to switch between my email and do this, and it's hard. Um, okay, so once you log into your Summit Academy email, it'll say that an error will pop up saying that you can't access your email, that like the administrator has said that you don't have access to it. That's totally fine. You don't need to get into your email. Um, unless you really want to figure out how. I don't know how. You don't need your email. It's fine. Um, once you are logged into your Summit Academy account, go to google.com. You can either do it in a new tab, a different tab, current tab, doesn't matter what tab you're on. Um, then you will need to go into the right-hand corner of the screen. So over, this is backwards, oh no it's not. There it is right there, right-hand side of the screen, and you'll see the little nine dots. You guys want to look at that to go to like Google Docs. Um, you guys are going to click on that and like a drop down menu will come down. You guys are going to click on the little picture. I think it's on a chalkboard that says classroom. Once you click, click on classroom, it'll show you all the classrooms that you're either a part of or that you've been invited to. Um, once you get to that page, it should have like a picture of whatever classes you've been invited to. And in the bottom right hand corner of each of the classes, there's a little button that says join. All you have to do is click join and then you'll immediately be added to class. Hopefully that helps some people. I know at least three of you guys have joined since I sent out the instructions on how to join. Um, but if you guys are still having trouble, like I sent out an email, um, feel free to email me or you could ask me a question now. It's up to you. Um, but like I said, there are assignments posted already, so I would want to get into my Google Classroom as soon as I could, but that's on you, whatever you guys want. Um, I also sent out an email that I tried to post a YouTube tutorial of it. Um, Mr. Fitzpatrick has been in the process of figuring out how to do this, but showing like his screen along with himself as he like walks you through stuff. Um, so I'm going to try to figure out how to do that so that if the directions are confusing, then you can just watch me go through it. Um, but I'd be doing it from a different email, not a student email, just FYI. So I guess we'll start with the sixth grade packet, this fun one about the fish. The other thing too, you guys, probably already saw this, but I posted videos of me reading at least the first, I think for you guys, for the sixth graders, it was just the first three pages, three or four pages, five pages, like five pages. Um, and you guys can either listen to it if that helps you. If you guys are stuck in the car, you can listen to it. If your siblings are being really loud and annoying, you can listen to it. Listen to it as many times as you want. Um, okay, so if you flip to page 150, it has on the 
to the left hand side. The left hand side over here, it has like words to know. There's a box. We'll get to that in a second. And then these little site evidence passages. Um, by the way, if you're not in sixth grade, this won't make sense to you because you don't have a sixth grade packet. Just FYI. Um, okay, so you guys had this one's about like the tundra, the frozen ecosystem, all that good stuff. What I did is I wrote down definitions. You can't see them, but definitions of the words that it says you guys should know. Um, all I did to find these definitions was just go to dictionary.com and it gives you the different definitions. Um, the only reason I researched my own definitions is so that you guys would have the correct ones. Because I know sometimes, especially with these words, because a lot of them are like science type words, it gives you like a verb definition and like a noun definition. And if it's a different part of speech, that means a completely different thing. So you might be on the right track, but you might not have the correct definition. Um, I'm fortunate enough at home to have a printer that has a scanner. So I, once I'm done with this, maybe even tomorrow, um, I will scan because I hand wrote them. Thanks, Miss Yingling. Um, I will scan these and upload them to the Google Classroom. So another reason you should join the Google Classroom. Um, but you guys will have these. So when you're reading and you're answering questions, because some of the site evidence questions have to do with the vocab, you guys have the actual correct definitions and no one's confused. Okay, so the first one that I have is cycle. A cycle is a series of events that are regularly repeated in the same order. The next word I have is ecosystem, a biological community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. Tundra. Vast, flat, treeless Arctic region of Europe, Asia, and North America in which the subsoil is permanently frozen. Unique, having nothing alike or equal. So those are the first four terms on page 150. Um, if you guys go down to the site evidence, you guys have to do those if you want full credit for these packets, which you do. Um, you can either do it if you want to type it in the Google Doc and share it to me. You can either write it in a notebook if you can somehow squeeze it on the packet itself. You can write it on there. I just need you guys to turn in something when I see you again. Um, so site evidence A, a domain specific word relates to a specific topic. In paragraph one, ecosystem is a domain specific word in science. Circle another domain specific word on this page. I also looked up domain specific vocabulary or word because this definition I found made more sense to me than the definition that I got from the packet. Um, so domain specific vocabulary is a word or language that is directly related to a specific class or thing. So for example, um, theme is a word that you probably hear in mine and Mr. Murray's classroom all the time. But a word like ecosystem is something that you might hear more so with Mr. Fosnight and Mr. Siriani. So those are domain specific vocabulary. Obviously in this reading packet, you guys are gonna come across ecosystem, but in English class, we don't use that word every day. Um, another thing I know we were working on right before we had this weird break, um, like main idea. Main idea would be a domain specific word for English class. So if you guys have questions about that, let me know. Thanks, Ms. Yingling, again. I also think that that's Alex in the comments too, but I don't know because you guys all have weird fun names. Um, anyway, in the B part, an academic word is used more in writing than in speaking, but it is not specific to a topic. You will often see these words in text you study in school. In paragraph three, cycle is an academic word. Put a box around another academic word on this page and discuss what you think it means. Um, also, all the paragraphs in these packets, if you can see it, on oh, no, the wrong side, my bad, are numbered. So like paragraph three, that bolded word is cycle. So if you guys are like, I don't know where paragraph three is, you don't have to count. It's counted for you. 
Um, so academic vocabulary, I also looked up my own definition for that. Um, words that are traditionally used in academic text. So example, modify, analyze, detect. So if we tell you to modify your sentence structure, it's still a word that you use more so in education than you would in like everyday vocabulary. Um, or if we ask you to analyze the equation and tell us where someone went wrong, that's another way that we use academic vocabulary, but usually don't tell people talking face to face to analyze their work. Um, Alex, I like all of these. You're welcome. Okay, so moving on. If you flip to page 151 of the sixth grade packet, there are more things on the side column under the picture. Um, so to determine a word's meaning, you can use context clues, which are nearby words that help you infer what a word means. In paragraph seven, underline the words that help you understand the meaning of precipitation. You guys might already know what precipitation is, so this should be a fairly easy question. Um, but using context clues. So if we go to paragraph seven, I'll just read it. Arctic tundra gets more precipitation than does alpine tundra. In areas of Arctic tundra, it rains in the summer and the winter can bring heavy snow in the form of blizzards. Permafrost prevents water from seeping deep into the soil, so Arctic permafrost can get very soggy. Um, so one of the ways that I would know, using my context clues, what precipitation means is they're talking about rain and snow. It's like the wet stuff that falls from the sky. Um, so if you wanted to underline it, where it says it rains in the summer and the winter can bring heavy snow in the form of blizzards, that would be how you do something like C for the citing evidence part. Uh, moving on to D. It says words may be defined within the sentence. Circle the sentence with the definition of permafrost. Some words are referred to in a different way. This is called restatement. Binary statement of lichen, lichens, I don't know how to say it, honestly, I don't do science. Um, in paragraph nine, and place the star next to it. Look up lichens, lichens, however you want to say it, in a dictionary and discuss the adif additional information you found about the word. Um, you guys don't necessarily, oh, my dog left. He didn't want to sit on my lap, so I'm sorry if you came for Winston, but... Winston's not here right now. Maybe I can go get him when I transition between packets, but he's busy doing whatever Winston does. Um, sorry. Anyway, um, to do that one, so a reinstate or restatement is basically just where they give you the definition um, in, where is paragraph nine? Okay, they give you the definition in the paragraph, but it might not necessarily be, or say like permafrost is, it'll just say permafrost is blah, 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 and explain like how it specifically affects the tundra, not necessarily how it, like the exact definition, like I read them to you. Um, okay, at the bottom of that page, there's also a little comprehension check. It says, think about the word ecosystem that appears in paragraph one, why was it important to know what that word means before you began learning about tundra? So if you flip back to the ecosystem definition, it says a biological community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. Um, for the comprehension check, you could put something as easy as, I knew I was learning about somewhere that living things live. You guys don't have to go all out and write me like paragraphs upon paragraphs to answer these. Um, just get the main idea of it. Okay, so then flipping over to page 152, um, there are only three vocabulary words for these pages. So I have exposed is visible, not covered, or hidden. Uh, predators is an animal that naturally preys on others and survive, which is continue to live or exist, especially in a hardship or danger. Um, you guys should pretty much know what all those words mean. They're pretty straightforward just because they're in more of a scientific type story doesn't mean 
that they mean anything different. Um, okay, so if you go down to A, where it says circle the words in paragraph 10 that provide clues to the meaning of survive, um, you guys would just, again, go to paragraph 10, um, and you would talk about what it means to survive. So maybe look up things for what you have to eat, like the kind of shelter you need. Like think of things that you need to survive because animals probably need those exact same things to survive. Um, for site evidence B, underline the words in paragraph 11 that help you define migration. So migration might be another word that you guys already know. That's fine. Just reread or read paragraph 11 um, and highlight something that kind of gives you the definition. Not everyone's going to underline the exact same thing. That's fine. We all interpret things differently. Um, how can you figure out what a Patarmigan is in paragraph 13? Does the author provide a definition, a context clue, or a restatement? What else on this page helps you figure out what a Patarmigan is? I don't know if I'm saying that right either. Um, the way that I know what it is is because there's a picture of it right there. I can't tell you what it actually is, but I think it's some type of bird. It looks like a chicken. Maybe it's a cousin to a chicken. I don't know. Um, okay. So that is page 152. If you guys flip over to 153, um, it has just, I think, three. Yeah, three comprehension check questions. So one says, circle the letter next to the definition of the word lemming. Um, you guys will have to go back in the text and find where it has that word. I'm not going to go back in the text for all of these for you because that would just make it too easy. Um, and you guys are basically just going to define lemming. I'm not telling you what a lemming is. Um, number two, circle the letter next to the definition of the verb adapt that best fits its use in paragraph 14. Paragraph 14 is on page 153, um, so you don't have to flip back to any pages. Um, so you could, I'll just read it to you. The tundra's plants can support insect life as well. The greatest challenge for tundra insects is, of course, enduring the cold temperatures. There are fewer insect species living in tundra than in other ecosystems, but many tundra insects have special qualities that allow them to adapt to the tundra environment and survive. For example, most tundra spiders are very dark in color and will therefore observe light and stay warm. Um, so you just go through the multiple choice questions, pick the one that makes the most sense for adapt. Um, question three, how does the word migration help you understand the difference between alpine tundra and arctic tundra? Um, this is what this whole section is about. It says to work with a partner to compare your reasoning you obviously don't have to work with a partner. You can ask like a friend or me or a teacher or your parent or your neighbor. Ask someone if you're confused. We'll figure it out. Um, and it says to cite information from the text. So if you pick something out from paragraph 11, just be like in paragraph 11, this explains the difference between an alpine tundra and Ar arctic tundra. Um, so yeah, that is it for the sixth grade packet for now. Um, I will continue to make videos of me reading the packet for you guys, um, but I'm not gonna read the packet like all in one sitting. I'll probably do, it looks like the next for the sixth grade packet, it's about like a page and a half more of reading and then it has comprehension check questions. Um, so I'll probably try to do maybe one of those tomorrow. Um, and then post it and we'll, I guess, just break it down that way so that you guys aren't overwhelmed with the amount of work that you have to do because I like to be realistic and remember that I'm not your only teacher. Okay. Does anyone, if there are any sixth graders listening to this, have any questions about this packet before I say goodbye to it? We'll set it over there. Um, and then we will start with the seventh grade.
packet. The one that has, is this earth? It's in black and white. I can't tell. It's probably supposed to be earth. No one's asked any questions, so I'm moving on, if that's fine. So the seventh grade packet, I kind of did the same thing as I did with the sixth grade. I looked up all the definitions for you guys and wrote them down. Um, yeah, that's all I did for this one. And then I'll go over some of the questions, too, that are in the packet in case you guys have questions about those. Um, so we'll start this one. So again, you guys, seventh graders, have this packet. If you don't have this packet, you need to figure out why you don't have this packet. It is Earth. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Um, And that's the packet the seventh grade is doing. Um, also, Winston ran away when I was getting the whole live thing set up. He sat on my lap long enough to take the thumbnail picture and then booked it out of here. So I don't know what he's doing. Um, maybe dinner's being made right now, and he thinks that pieces of chicken dropping on the floor are more interesting than doing YouTube Live. <laughs> um, but maybe I will grab him at the end if we have time, or he can make an appearance, or I can maybe try to keep him on my lap next time, and we'll go from there. Anyway, so for the seventh grade packet, we are starting on page 168. You guys, at least for this section, it is saving the ozone layer. Um, so a list of words to know. I have molecule, a group of atoms bonded together. Um, the next one is ozone, a triatomic, very reactive form of oxygen that is a bluish, irritating gas of odor that is a major air pollutant in the lower atmosphere, but a beneficial component of the upper atmosphere. The next one is radiation, which is a transfer of heat. And then the last one on that page is ultraviolet light, which is a form of radiation that is invisible to the human eye. Um, so those are the definitions for that one. Oh. Good. I'm glad everyone's more excited for Winston than for me. <laughs> um, anyway, so if you go down to that same left side of the page, it has site evidence. Um, so the first site evidence A is the first step in determining the meaning of words in a technical text is to recognize the topic. Underline two words that tell you what this text is about. So your topic, if you guys, I know I just did this with the sixth graders, um, but if you guys think back, I know, I think it was Madison actually said, this is how you learned this guy this last year, um, but you think of your umbrella, if I'm explaining this the right way, and at the top of the umbrella, on the outside of the umbrella, is the topic, which is like your very general one, two word summary or statement of what you're about to read, what you're reading. And then I think it was right under, or it might have been the actual umbrella, was your main idea, which is like a one sentence summary of everything that you read or you're about to read um, that covers like your main details, but nothing like weird off the wall, like just covers, I like to think of it as like your plot points, so the important parts. Um, and then the supporting details were like the little raindrops coming down or rolling off the umbrella. Um, if that helps you think of it that way, Alex, you are not in the sixth grade, so whatever I said 20 minutes ago doesn't apply to you. But good one. I like your joke. Good one. Um, anyway, so you need to find the topic. Um, for this one, you can look at something as easy as the title, or you can just read paragraph one and underline one or two words that tell you the topic of what you're about to read. I honestly, for this one, would just underline ozone layer. I think that's the topic. I already read it. Um, so for site evidence B, the easiest way to determine the meaning of an unfamiliar word is to search the word nearby for a definition. Find a domain-specific word on page 169 that is defined in a sentence. 
double underline that sentence. Um, so remember, domain-specific vocabulary is stuff that spe specifically pertains to like the subject or what you are learning about. Um, honestly, for this one too, you could underline ozone. You could underline mesosphere. You could underline exosphere. You guys don't all have to underline the same thing. I'm not going to be that picky. Um, and then you, what is it? You double underline the sentence that you picked. So that was pretty easy. Um, if you guys flip over to page 169, there are more site evidence things this side or on the right side this time. Um, so site evidence C, some words have connotations. They create feelings beyond their literal meaning. <coughs> Ew, excuse me. Um, a word can have a negative or positive connotation. Underline a word in paragraph five that has a negative connotation. Um, so positive and negative connotations. You guys have probably used these, heard of these. You might not necessarily know what they are. Um, a word that has a negative connotation could be cough right now because I just coughed and that apparently means you're sick, but I just got over the flu, so I'm fine. Um, but if you like tell someone cough, like no one's like, wow, that's great. We're all having a wonderful time. It doesn't happen. Um, something that has like a positive connotation is like think of words like like my dog, Winston. If I ask him if he wants to go outside, like outside has a really positive connotation, like he's ready to go. Um, but just use that to find a word in paragraph five. Um that one's pretty easy because it talks about cancer. Cancer usually has a negative connotation. Um, D, technical text sometimes uses figurative language to help a reader understand a concept. One way that authors do this is to use similes, which compare unlike objects using like or as. Circle the sentence with an example of a simile in paragraph six. Another pro tip for this, just because a sentence uses like or as in it does not mean that it is a simile. Those words don't always mean simile. I know a lot of the time, too, if I talk, I say like. Just because I said like doesn't mean that I'm about to give you a simile. Um, so reread paragraph six and you can come up with your own simile. Um, for site evidence E. Another way that authors use figurative language is to include words that produce images in the reader's mind. This image can help the reader see something the writer is describing. Place a box around an example of such wording in paragraph seven. Um, they don't come out and directly say this, but they're talking about imagery. So think of if I were to describe the beach to you. You talk about there's sand, there's the sound of the waves crashing in, you hear kids laughing while they run around on the beach. Um, it kind of paints an image in your head, which makes it imagery. Um, there, This one's trickier, so if you guys have questions on this one, let me know. Um, but there are, I think, two different sentences that use imagery in paragraph seven. All right, moving on to page 170, um, there are more words to know, so I have those definitions for you. Um, aerosol, a suspension of particles dispersed in air or gas. Um, this word was one of the ones that I specifically defined for you because when a lot of people think aerosol, they think of like a hairspray bottle. Um, which it is an aerosol can, but it's not the same thing that this text wants you to think about. So again, aerosol is a suspension of particles dispersed in air or gas. The next one is depletion, the use or complete consumption of a resource. The next one is non-flammable, which means it does not catch fire. And the last one is solvent, the substance in which a solute, I misspelled that, is dissolved, which is usually a liquid. 
Um, so those are the words that you will need to know, I think, for the next two or three pages. Alex, we're doing seventh grade stuff now. We've moved on. <laughs> um, we'll eventually get to the eighth grade stuff. So if you want to stick around till the end, that's cool. Um, anyway, okay. So if you go to the site evidence on page 170. Okay. You can learn the seventh grade stuff too, Alex. It won't hurt. Um, so A, be aware of words that may be used as different parts of speech. Whether a word is a noun or a verb affects meaning. Circle a word in paragraph nine that appears as two different parts of speech. Um, so like I was saying for aerosol, an aerosol can and the aerosol that they're talking about in this are different. So keep that in mind. Maybe that word's in paragraph nine. I don't know. Um, so then site evidence B, personification is figurative language that gives human traits to non-human things. It adds interest to writing. Underline an example of personification in paragraph nine. So personification is when you give human-like qualities to non-living things. So if I say the wind made my hair dance, my hair cannot physically dance. It's getting blown around by the wind, but it's a more pleasant and nice way to say it. Um, okay. Moving on to page 171, there is site evidence C. An object called a siphon is men mentioned on these pages. Double underline the description of what it does. So my advice to you would be to find that word in what you just read. Um, and then underline the definition that it gives you. I'm trying to scan really quick for what paragraph it's in. But I don't. Oh, OK, it's in paragraph 10. So for site evidence, C, look at paragraph 10 and hopefully that'll help you. Um, for site evidence D, sometimes context does not define a word. Instead, it may describe conditions that help understanding. Look at the phrase global issue in paragraph 14. Circle the text that helps you understand its meaning. What does the context tell about its meaning? So you guys are trying to find the definition of global issue using the context clues again. So using the surrounding words, surrounding sentences to come up with the answer. Um, a lot of it too is you can just think of the word global and think of the word issue, break it into two separate things, get your answer that way. Um, and then at the bottom of page 171, it says for the comprehension check, the text says CFCs found CFCs found uses as refrigerants. Divide refrigerant into its parts to define it. Based on this definition, why would CFCs be a large problem? Um, so you would go and think of like compound words like playground, like stuff like that, that are two different words that have been smushed together to make a big one. That's kind of what you're doing for the comprehension check. You're breaking apart the words. So if we do playground, play, you play and then ground, you play on those grounds in that area. That's how you come up with the definition for playground. Do that for refrigerant on page 171. Okay, um, moving on to page 172. Um, we have, I combined them. I think there's actually five words, but they make more sense if you put two of them together. So we have cataract, which is a medical condition in which vision becomes blurred. Um, the next ones are malignant and melanoma. Um, again, I put them together because I think they make more sense for what you guys are reading when they're combined and they're not two separate words. Um, so a malignant melanoma is a skin cancer that begins in cells called melanocytes might be saying that wrong. Um, the next word is propellant, which is a substance that propels something. Um, the next one is regulation, which are laws or rulings by academic or governmental bodies. Um, 
So like we have rules and regulations for like the amount of pollution we can put into our earth, stuff like that. Um, moving into the site evidence ones for this page. In this section, the text uses medical terms to discuss effects of a weakened immune system. Underline three examples of diseases. Discuss with a partner what reference sources could be used to learn about these diseases. So reference sources are things that you would turn to to maybe look up definitions, get more information. Um, you could say if you like, if you, okay, we'll find a disease. One of the diseases that it gives you is one of your vocabulary words, cataracts. Um, I just gave you the definition, again, dictionary.com, the internet. That could be one of the sources that you use to learn more about that disease. Um, the other thing, too, if you guys know like a college student and they're studying nursing, cataracts are probably in their nursing book somewhere. You could use that as a resource. Um, again, you don't have to discuss it with a partner. If you are really struggling, you can ask someone for help, but you do not have to find a partner for this. Um, for B, it says paragraph 17 talks about international efforts to repair the ozone layer. Circle two terms that name particular examples of these efforts. Um, so these could be organizations, certain people, certain laws, just how people are taking action to stop the damage to the ozone layer. Um, okay, so then if you go to page 173, there are five questions, sorry, seventh graders, um, that you guys need to answer under the comprehension check. The first four are multiple choice. So number one, the text mentions the signing of the Montreal Protocol in 1987. What is the most likely meaning of protocol? Um, so go back in the text again and use your context clues to figure out what protocol means um, because it makes more sense used in that context than it would just looking up the definition. Question two, in paragraph 18, original is defined by an antonym, a word with the opposite meaning that appears near it. Which word is this? Um, so antonyms are, if I say good, an antonym for good is bad. That is an antonym. Don't think too much into it. Um, for three, describe phrase or which phrase from paragraph 16 is an example of negative health effects. So it's giving you different phrases to look at. Look at the one that would be bad for your health. Um, like, for example, A is marine life. Marine life is not bad for your health. Like, even if you want to come up with some weird scenario, like getting attacked by a shark, marine life is not bad for your health. Don't circle A. Um, in paragraph 18, how do the words near the word phase out explain what it means? So again, using context clues to come up with the definition for phase out. Then number five is the text uses the technical term melanoma. What clues in the text help you figure out what melanoma means? How does knowing the meaning of this term add to what you know about the effects of ozone depletion? Um, melanoma is not defined by itself in this packet, but again, if you use the definition I gave you, which is a skin cancer that begins in cells called melanocytes, um, that should help you. So that is the end of the seventh grade packet. If there are any seventh graders here, or if Alex, if you have any questions about the seventh grade packet, I'll answer them now. <clears throat> okay, um, then I guess we're going to start the eighth grade packet, which is this one with like the scientist lady on it. Um, I think you guys also had like six or seven pages that you had to read. So sorry that your packet was a little longer. Um, why does the stream slow down my download speeds? Because it's a live stream. I know that always takes up more stuff. I don't really know. Sorry, but I'm killing your download speeds. Um, okay, 
So same thing. You guys have site evidence questions. You also have definitions. I defined things for you, eighth graders. I will upload these to the Google Classroom probably tomorrow morning because I have to fight with my scanner, figure out how it works before I can actually scan anything. Um, but I will upload the definitions so you guys can use them and have them when you're working through the packet. Um, not all the definitions is as necessary as the packet makes it out to be. But either way, you have them, you can use them, they'll help you figure things out. It's all good. So the first four definition or the first four words I have are biosphere, which are regions of the surface, atmosphere, and hydrosphere of the earth occupied by living organisms. Um, the next one is catastrophe, something harmful or disastrous. Next one is estimate, rough calculation or judgment. And then the last one is size, seismologist, scientific study of earthquakes. Fun fact, there was an earthquake in Utah today. So there were actually people studying earthquakes today, doing things. Um, okay, moving on to the site evidence questions on page 168. So A, informational text like literary text may include figurative language to help readers visualize and understand concepts. An allusion is a kind of figurative language that makes a reference to a person, event, or idea from history, the arts, or mythology. Circle an allusion on this page. Look up the reference and explain how it affects the meaning and tone of the text. Um, I know probably a month ago we went over this with the sixth grade, seventh and eighth grade. We went over this like way in the beginning of the year, like August, September. Um, but like the packet states, an illusion is like a historical reference or a reference to something else. It could be, honestly, it could be referencing like a comic. It could be like a TV show. It doesn't necessarily have to be historical. Um, we are not playing Minecraft. I also don't know who Young Young Gangster is, but hello. Um, my little brother plays Minecraft. He's eight. Maybe I can do a random live stream of him playing Minecraft. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> um, so an illusion. Like if I were to give an example of an illusion, I could do something. Oh, look, your guys is what would Miss Vaughn say bracelets that you guys had? Like, I didn't know what that was in the beginning of the year. So, like, if someone was like, oh, yeah, we should make bracelets like the one we made for Miss Vaughn, you are alluding to something else. Like, if no one explained it to me and if no one gave me a bracelet, I wouldn't know what it is. Um, okay. So, on site evidence B. Authors of scientific texts meant for the general public often provide context clues for the technical terms they include in their texts. Underline the details in paragraphs one and two that help you determine the meaning of the term seismic waves. So same thing, using, oh, it's Malachi. Hi, Malachi. Um, so same thing, use your context clues to figure out the definition of seismic waves. Again, you can also use dictionary.com or an actual dictionary and look up what seismic waves are. This specifically, though, asks you to underline something in the text so you won't get full credit unless you actually underline it. So you have to use the text. If looking up definitions helps you to figure out definition in using context clues, that's fine, too. I don't care. Um, okay. So moving on to site evidence C on page 169, an author may include a non-example or an example of something that is not in order to help readers understand a technical term. Underline the non-example on this page. Double underline the term it explains. Um, so that is in paragraph five. Again, paragraph five. I wrote that down as a note for myself so you guys wouldn't have to search through it. Um, Look for the not example of cosmic dust. Um, it tells you what cosmic dust is not to help you get an idea of what it is. Um, so think about it this way. Like if you only, why does Winston need to go out? He's not even like whining. 
how do you hear my dog? And I don't hear my own dog. Confused. Um, anyway, so like if you're trying to describe to someone what a horse is, but you, they've only ever seen a dog, you could be like, well, a horse doesn't have paws. A horse doesn't have a tail like a dog. Yes, a horse is a long-legged dog. Good one. Um, okay, so moving on to cite evidence D. An author may explain a technical term by providing an example, box the effect of an impact event on our biosphere. Um, anyway, um, so my tip to you is look up the bolded word biosphere. The bolded words are the big, thicker, black bolded ones. Um, and it'll take you to that word and what it means. Going to cite evidence E, to help readers understand a concept, an author may use an analogy, a comparison pointing out similarities between different things. Place an asterisk, which is a star, um, next to an analogy on this page. What two things are being compared? How does the analogy help you understand what the author is describing? I made a note um, for paragraph seven. So look at paragraph seven for site evidence E. Um, again, an analogy is a comparison pointing out similarities between two or more different things. So any questions on that? Because I know I have at least two eighth graders here. No? None? We're all good? You're sick? I'm sorry. I'm sick? I don't know. Anyway, um, page 170, words you need to know. Designation, the action of choosing a specific place. Diameter, a straight line passing from side to side through the center of a figure. Um, elongated, long in relation to width. Interchangeable, two or more things that can be changed without issue. And then spherical, I put 3D circle. Is that RuneScape like kind of an old game? Like I thought people played that like when I was in elementary school. Okay, um, site evidence A. You can sometimes determine the meaning of a technical term by looking for information that explains the term's effect on something. Double underline the effect that helps you understand the meaning of gravitational force. So again, try to find gravitational force and use the context clues surrounding that word to help you. Cite evidence B. Technical terms may be defined over several sentences or even an entire paragraph. A series of facts and examples taken together may define the term in detail. Place an asterisk next to each paragraph on this page that provides an extended definition of a technical term. So again, look at like the bolded words because that will help you figure out what the technical terms are. World of Warcraft is also kind of normal. Um, site evidence C, look at nearby context clues to determine the meaning of an unfamiliar technical word or phrase. What is an elongated elliptical orbit? Underline the clue on this page that helps you understand what the term means. So again, you're just looking at context clues to find definitions. Um, okay, this is important. So on page 171, there are two different site evidence prompts. It's site evidence D and site evidence E. You guys do not not, not, have to do those ones. Um, I didn't really think that they went along with what you guys were reading, and we didn't really think they would benefit you in any way, so I put X's through them. Um, so you guys don't have to do those ones. If you do decide to do them, I will give you a bonus point for doing them. But again, that's 100% on you. If you don't want more work, don't do them. You don't have to. I'm not going to take points away if you don't do them. Um, 
you do need to do the comprehension check at the bottom of page 171, where it says, how does understanding the meaning of the word orbit help you understand how Earth or how near Earth objects can be a threat to Earth? Thank you again, this is Yingling, full of compliments. Um, okay, moving on to page 172. You guys have another five vocabulary words. Um, the definitions for those are monitors, a device used to observe something while recording records. Peer is to look at, plausibly, something that appears likely radiates, emitting or giving off energy, and verify, make sure something is true or accurate. Um, those are your five vocabulary words. Those will help you again. Um, okay, say evidence A, circle the sentences that describe the steps NASA takes when tracking threats. How does reading the steps in sequence help you determine the meaning of the word verify? So again, looking for words or context clues to help you define verify. I also gave you the definition, um, but the definition isn't in the packet. And remember, you have to have something to underline. Um, I also put paragraph 18 and 19. So I think the word is used in paragraphs 18 and 19. Otherwise, I wouldn't have made that note for myself. Um, site evidence B, working with a partner, underline details that help you understand what the word radiates means. Explain the type of context clue you are given. Is it an extended definition, an explanation of an effect, a non-example, or an example? Um, so you're just trying to figure out how the word is explained to you. That one's kind of confusing. You guys, if you struggle with that one, just try your best. It's worded really weird. Um, okay, so then moving over to page 173, you guys also have five comprehension check questions. Four of them are multiple choice. One of them is an extended response question. Um, what is happening in these comments? <laughs> Number one, which aspect of an asteroid does the term diameter describe? So again, diameter was one of the vocab words. You probably already know what that means from math class, so you don't even have to bother to look up the definition again. Um, Number two, what do words like refining and considers in paragraph 22 suggest? So go back to paragraph 22, which is on page 172. Reread that paragraph. Pick the best answer. Number three, what the following is not a factor that NASA studies when refining its predictions according to the text? Um, the answer for that one is on page 172. I'm not going to tell you where on 172, but you can find the answer for that on 172. Number four, which words in paragraph 20 serve as context clues for the word peer? Um, so I know when I hear the word peer, I think of like your classmates, your friends, coworkers, your peers. This is a different type of peers. That's why I gave you the definitions. So do not use like your friend peer definition. Use the looks at definition. Um, number five, review the language the author uses in the paragraphs on pages 172 and 173 to describe NASA's work. What impact does the use of language have on the meaning and tone of what is being described? Um, so again, going back to pages 172, 173, rereading that, that's, oops, excuse me, how you're getting your answer. Um, tone. Do you guys know what tone is? Yes, no? Someone answer this. Um, so tone is kind of like the emotion that kind of like washes over you as you're reading something. For tone, don't put boring. Like I know this might not be something you guys want to read, but don't put that for tone. Um, tone could also be colors. If we were in art class, we are not. Um, do you guys have any questions for the eighth grade packet? Because if not, I'll go get Winston and he can hang out for a second and then it'll be over. All 
All right, ask your questions. I'll go get my dog. Be right back. Okay. Get off my arm. Here he is. He just woke up from a nap. Anyone have any questions for Winston? He has also been working from home with me. So he basically is certified to teach English now. Okay. He does not look like a burrito. How does my dog look like a burrito? No. Look, he even has his cute little blue cactus bandana on. I'm going to take his wrap off. Um, I don't think Winston can play RuneScape because there's not thumbs. No thumbs, just paws. You can't leave. Stay here. Oh, hi, Madison. I didn't know Madison was here. Um, okay. But, is that Carmelo? Everyone is meeting my dog. I'm really glad we are now up to six people watching this, that I brought my dog out, and that whatever I said wasn't important. Um, I don't know what Dark Souls is. Are you falling asleep? Um, okay, so I guess we're gonna go. If you guys missed the stuff that I went over, um, this will be saved as a video like all the other ones. So if you are specifically looking for just the sixth and seventh grade stuff, not the eighth grade stuff, you can go back. Um, also feel free to email me. My email is page.miller at summitacademies.org. You spell my name P-A-I-G-E if you don't know how. Um, Alex, I would never fight my dog. Like that's rude. Look at Winston. Why would anyone fight him? Look, he's falling asleep. Okay, um, but Winston and I are gonna go eat dinner. So please don't email me about my dog though. That's weird. Bye.